after that very eloquent, uh, you know, piece from Manu, I'm glad that I had the wisdom or foresight to go to a completely different problem and not repeat what Matt and Manu would be already saying. I figured that's what they would be talking about. So I, f I chose to talk about something different, uh, basically because I knew who was going to talk before me. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, was, I thought I would take a slightly different slant and talk about uh, resilience produced, provided by groundwater in mountain watersheds, which uh, might offset some of the concerns that are coming up because of climate change. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, the Colorado Basin and then about some of the Himalayan basins, uh, just to contrast. So in the upper Colorado Basin, for example, some recent work, you know, which is based on uh, conductivity mass balance type analysis, uh, suggests that about, I mean, more than half the stream flow actually comes from a base flow derived source. Uh, although 80% of that then gets lost to ETA and diversions before it goes to the lower basin. But the fact is that a lot of this water is coming through a groundwater flow pathway into the stream and manifest a stream flow. And in the two graphs that are shown there, it shows that the base flow yield is higher at higher elevations. But as you come to the lower uh, reaches, the higher order streams, you actually find that the fraction of the annual stream flow that is provided by base flow is uh, significantly higher. Okay? And that's, that 56% number is sort of like an average. When you come to the lower elevations, it can be as much as 60, 65%. Okay? Uh, so there is some measure of res resilience there because groundwater we think of as a store that has a little more uh, uh, you know, delay in uh, delivering hydrologic inputs to streams and can sustain late season flows. Uh, that being said, in uh, much of the U.S., the climate change scenarios provide a grim uh, portrayal of hydrologic inputs, and you know, we cannot assume that this is an entirely optimistic uh, set of circumstances. Uh, so at the smaller scales, which people are starting to study now, where uh, on the right frame, uh, the East River study, the DOE SFA, which is a very nicely funded piece of work, and several other you know, similar works in uh, the Oregon Cascades and in the uh, Sierras, uh, there's a lot more appreciation now of the role of deep groundwater in the hydrologic budgets and the water budgets of these uh, uh, you know, fairly water stress systems that... Uh, have not been considered in the previous work, as Manu pointed out, that from a hydroclimatic perspective, typically look more at shallower depths. But when you look at the role of deep groundwater, for example, at this uh, East River study site, when you take the annual snowmelt pulse and ask, well, how deep is that producing a groundwater circulation? That's in the range of about 80 meters. Uh, so that is fairly deep compared to what typical uh, land surface models are able to capture. Uh, and a lot of the climate change projections, the coupled models don't, you know, are beginning to, and Laura, I'm sure Laura will talk a little bit more about the role of deep groundwater. Uh, and in the southwestern U.S., uh, there is some evidence that suggests that the reduced recharge, you know, will have significant influence on uh, groundwater availability and even in these mountain systems. And in, uh, in some unusual instances, you actually get some very strange water quality consequences of declining water tables. Uh, for example, in mineralized watersheds, you get higher metal loads in streams, uh, very, very strong 30-year uh, trends that are uh, putting some of these metals concentrations in streams, in small mountain streams, to be above uh, you know, aquatic life standards. Uh, very little is known about uh, you know, some of the more remote areas in the Himalayas, which are, uh, from a geopolitical perspective, fairly uh, sensitive areas. The recent Charis project that was a fairly comprehensive study of uh, water budgets in the Himalayan basins, uh, you know, contrary to a lot of previous notions, uh, glacier loss is not a big contributor to you know, the water budgets in these systems. It's snowmelt and precip, and if you come to a basin like the Ganges, it's actually monsoon rain that controls most of the action and not even, I mean, snowmelt to some extent, but monsoon rain. Okay. And, and a combination of the monsoon and rainfall forcing, uh, even that actually is delivered to the streams when we look at the right frame uh, via groundwater flow pathways. Uh, that's a very nice, it's a data set, it's real data, it's not a modeled data. Uh, this, the color scale there is the time, blue colors are early in the year and red colors are later in the year. This anti-clockwise uh, hysteresis loop basically says that uh, look at the one-to-one one -one line also. In most of the year, you actually have stream flows that exceed 
precipitation inputs. Uh, that signifies the delay that is coming because of a groundwater pathway. Two-thirds of the annual discharge in the upper Ganges Basin actually is coming from a groundwater pathway that implies a delay of about two months. And there is a certain level of resilience there. Uh, what's really kind of intriguing is that uh, climate change impact projections in the Himalayan basins suggest that you're going to get an increase in precip. Uh, I don't know how, you know, I'm not an expert in, in the sense of how much to believe these projections. Uh, for example, in uh, some parts of the upper Ganges basin, it's projected that you'll have a 30% increase in stream flow because of climate change induced precip increase. And in the Karakoram ranges, uh, in RCP 8.5, even 80%. Uh, uncertainty surrounding these numbers, I, I don't know, but you know, it's very intriguing to think about uh, if you were going to send troops there, you have to drill a well and you have all the water that you need from some of these mountain groundwater systems. So that might be uh, you know, something that is opposite to the more plains-type groundwater systems where depletion is really more of a concern. Uh, and of course, you know, to answer these questions more reliably, how do you go about uh, characterizing mountain groundwater systems uh, and maybe there are some airborne and remote sensing solutions there. So I'll stop there and 